Coming up on this week's show, some great news for Sega arcade fans. How to turbocharge your Dreamcast. We chat chip tunes and making music with C Tricks from Debug Live. This week's show is brought to you by ExpressVPN and our friends at Harry's. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 232, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And just before we started recording then, we looked at the episode number 232. <laughs> Joe was like, that is a lot of episodes that we've done. And actually, I think we've kind of been reminded of that over the last week because one of our listeners, um, a guy called Deadlock on Twitter, tweeted us a list of every episode of the Retro Hour podcast that he's put together. We've had a lot of guests on this show, I think it's fair to say. It's, it's crazy because this is like in a PDF, so all of you guys can download it. You can check out the previous guests because a lot of people don't actually realise how many people we've had on. And, you know, we forget, don't we, sometimes? <laughs> we, we, we'll go, oh, have we had this guy on the show? Yeah, this episode. So it's really useful to have this episode guide and... Uh, I'm hopefully going to convert it into a kind of web format as well. So we'll have just a big list on the site. I think you made a good point then as well, because there has been occasions when I've almost been about to tweet someone to us on the podcast. And then, uh, you know, you go inside the Twitter DM history. And um, I saw that we had them on like two or three years ago. That's happened more than <laughs> once, I must admit. So, uh, yeah, cheers for doing that deadlock. We really appreciate that. And actually, it's uh, today we're going to have another great addition to that as well. Now, this show, come on, Ravi. How excited are you for this week's show? All your favorite things together. We're going to be talking chip tunes, going to be talking Amigas, we're going to be talking performing with this week's special guest, one of our favorite chip tune composers the amazing c tricks from debug live oh yeah c tricks is absolutely amazing i remember the first time we saw c tricks and it was dan shared me this video and it was like this kind of small club in australia he was playing on an amiga and everybody was just losing it going totally mental jumping up and down dancing to it and it just looked fantastic well Citrix works with old computers making video game music, but it's not just Amigas. He works with Mega Drives. He built a thing called the Guitari, which was like an Atari 2600 kind of guitar, which is awesome. That was shared all over the Verge and Hacker Day, but also he's toured worldwide. So he's gone to some fantastic festivals like Blip Festival, which no longer exists actually in Tokyo and just all over the world. People have been loving c Trick, so we have a real kind of nerdy chat about making video game music. And Ravi loves doing the interviews from Australia. What time did you have to get up to record this one? Oh, quite early, but I, I had to feed <laughs> the chickens anyway. And another thing c Trick does is uh, he does really interesting videos on video game music as well. So you might have seen some of his stuff on the channel Debug Live, where he's kind of exploring Amiga samplers and showing us how they made this music previously. And LGR actually featured him a couple of weeks ago in a video as well, so a lot of people may have come across him since then. But, I mean, his videos are really, really well produced as well. I mean, they're put together beautifully, and he goes really in-depth into, you know, there's one on there about how music was sampled on the Amiga, and then he goes in-depth on how to use stuff like Pro Tracker and Noise Tracker. That to me, as a kid, you know, I always kind of played around with that software, but I never had any idea what I was doing, really. So I've actually found those videos like, really useful and really interesting. Oh, yeah, they're great. And, you know, his route to making music was totally different. He was composing mods on a 486 so he wasn't even using an Amiga <laughs> a really interesting interview this one is and was he a bit of an inspiration for you then because obviously you do you like you know you're DJing on Amigas oh, 100% he was one of the first people I saw DJing with them and uh, you know I've always been like see Trick send me your tunes you know just har <laughs> harassing him for years <laughs> and see Trick is going to be our special guest he'll be on the show in around 15 minutes from now now, we've got lots of Sega news around this week that I know Joe is chomping at the bit to talk about, so we'll do that in just a minute. Before we do, let's give a big shout-out to this week's supporter, our very good friends at Harry's. Now, Harry's have actually got a really interesting story behind them. Two guys, Jeff and Andy, who were fed up with overpriced razors, and they decided they were on a mission to fix shaving. And the only way that they could do that and ensure quality was by buying and setting up their own factory. Now, the idea is that they take less profit and offer you you a great quality product for a fair price and their amazing quality blades are actually almost half the price of the leading five blade brand and recently i know we've all been trying at harry's haven't we especially because we've all had like you know a little bit too much hair 
with it being in COVID lockdown over the last few months. <laughs> yeah, I've I've been using Harry's, and uh, you know, I'm probably the biggest beard owner on the Retro Hour. Uh, so I kind of need to keep that beard trimmed and, you know, keep the angles good. But the main problem I've had is like when you're going down, uh, uh, when you, I usually shave against the grain and I've Ouch. been using Harry's and it's kind of very smooth and the, the grip's really nice as well. So I actually don't feel like I need to shave against the grain. And I know it's like the baddest thing to do, isn't it? Because you get like ingrown hairs and all of this stuff. But that was the only way. I could get a really decent shave. But with Harry's, it, it's really nice. And the blades are especially sharp, which is great to have a smooth, really nice shave. And Joe's dad actually told him he had to shave his beard off, so we sorted him out with some Harry's to do that. <laughs> yeah, so I had both my dad, my wife, and my father-in-law all mention how bushy and horrible my beard was getting. So I did take the plunge a couple of weeks ago, and I mentioned it on last week's episode. And you know what? I was really pleased with the results because usually I get, like Ravi said, really bad ingrown hairs. And I haven't actually got them this time. So I'm definitely going to be sticking with Harry's. Well, there you go. Look at that. Harry saving relationships and families. <laughs> now, we would like you to start shaving today by claiming your own trial set. And of course, you'll be helping out the podcast by doing this for £3.95. That will get delivered to you, including a razor handle, the five blade cartridge, foaming shave gel, a travel blade cover as well. All you have to do is sign up right now at harrys.com forward slash retro to try. Thanks to our good friends at Harry's, harrys.com forward slash retro. Now, Sega have been busy over the last couple of months. I mean, we obviously had the, the Game Gear Mini news. We had that cloud arcade gaming story that apparently was going to change the world of video games a couple of weeks ago. But actually, this announcement has kind of slid under the radar a little bit. But I actually think this is more exciting news than the Game Gear Mini for me. They're going to be doing an Astro City arcade cabinet mini. Yeah, I saw this today. Um, funny enough, I, I actually said to the guys, I was like, oh, we need to talk about this today. And Dan and Ravi were like, we already have it in the show notes, man. And I was just like, oh, wicked. So <laughs> way I thought, ahead of you there, Jim. Way ahead of me. So I saw this this morning. I think it was announced yesterday at the point of recording. It was yesterday. And um, I, like Dan says, I'm way more excited about the Sega Astro City Mini than I am the Game Gear Mini or the online service stuff they're doing. So essentially, from what I understand, the Astro City was like the iconic Japanese kind of like Sega cabinet, arcade cabinet. And it came out in like... The one with the green buttons, isn't it? Yeah, with the green buttons. And it came out in 93. And it's also what like the Dreamcast uh, fighting sticks like based on as well. So it looks really cool. It's going to have 36 built-in games. Uh, They've only announced 10 so far. But what's really interesting is for me, is Golden Golden Axe Revenge of Death Adder is going to be on there, which is going to be the first ever official release of that game, home release of that game by Sega. You can get it on Arcade 1-Up, but this is the first time Sega have ever done that. So it's kind of like they're listening to the fans, uh, which I think is really, really cool. But so far, they've only announced it for Japan, and it's going to be, I think it's 12,000 yen, which is about $120. So I don't know if it's going to be coming out over in the UK or not, but What's really cool about it is you can hook it up to your TV as well. So you can play it on your TV from what I understand. And you can put a uh, USB controller to it as well, which I think, you know, is a lot nicer than playing on like a four inch screen personally. Yeah. So looking at it, it looks quite nice. Uh, It is really small, but I was going to say the price is quite high, like $119 for it for maybe £300 in the UK. You can get the um, one up actual arcade cabinet that's like quite a big size you know not this tiny thing yeah but but i guess that's it's it's limited to a few games right that one up cabinet yeah so the arcade one up they tend to only have like three or four games on them and obviously they look fantastic like i really 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 want the golden axe one and i really want the turtles one but i think my wife would kill me if i if she suddenly came home one day and there was an arcade (laughs) set up in the kitchen (laughs) but i think what's Like you say, it is quite expensive at $120. So if they do come out in the UK, it would probably be about £110, £120 anyway. Do you think they're going to be popular in Japan then? Because this Astro City, it it must have been a a huge kind of popular Japanese arcade. Yeah, I've I've not seen many of them in the UK. When I went to Japan, I went to a lot of the arcades, the the game centers as they call them, and I went to Super Potato as well. And they had them up uh, on the third floor. And literally, like that was like the main arcade cabinet you saw everywhere. Like they were just everywhere. Those white, the white ones with the green stripes. 
And I think there's a lot of that about wanting the Sega arcade games at home as well. I mean, like you said then, I remember playing Golden Axe Revenge of Death Adder and I was always convinced it was going to come out, you know, if not on the Mega Drive, it'd come out yeah. on Saturn or something like that. And obviously it never did. Yeah. So I think, you know, if they're going to be kind of putting these games that you could only experience in the arcade on these home machines. I mean, you mentioned then that you could hook it up to a TV with HDMI and you can probably plug in like an Xbox controller. That kind of defeats your object a little bit, <laughs> yeah, cabinet, yeah. in my opinion. I guess but... it's just an official way of playing it at home. But like the video I was watching this morning uh, was saying that Virtual uh, Fighter's going to Fighter's going to be on it. And that's the first yeah. ever, it's going to be the first ever arcade perfect port of it. It'd be quite funny if you had a MAME cabinet and then you went up and you put this mini arcade on it and then plugged it in and it was like, <laughs> that's the one that I'm playing at the moment. You know, it would yeah. be quite nice. Arcade Inception. <laughs> yeah, that would be quite funny. <laughs> You know what? I, I do like the look of it. And again, I think, you know, these Astro City machines, they are iconic. And I think for a lot of people who wanted one at home, I mean, I imagine they're probably getting harder to find, especially the originals with the, I think they've got like a 19-inch CRT in there as well. Yeah. One thing I do like, though, is unlike the Game Gear Mini, this does actually look like it's big enough to be usable. Yeah, this is seven inches with a 4.8-inch screen, I think, yeah. or is it 3.8-inch screen, something like that. So kind of like your phone kind of size screen. But yeah, it does actually look a little bit more playable, but then really similar to the Neo Geo arcade mini that came out a year or two ago. And I know a few people had issues with them and just said it was better just to play them on the big screen. So we'll see, right. I guess. One thing I like, one little nice bit of attention to detail is even though obviously it's like a, an LCD screen in there, they've actually curved the glass a little bit by the looks of it. So it kind of imitates a, a curved CRT. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's little things that we love Sega for, isn't it? But I think, you know, this news should have been bigger. It's way more exciting than, you know, the, the cloud gaming thing they announced a couple yeah, of years ago. Think, yeah, so. which was as big <laughs> as the PS5. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it coming, Sega. Keep surprising us. Now, actually, speaking of systems that you might want to choose over your PS5, it's now been announced. It is coming out on November 27th, in time for the holidays this year, the Atari VCS release date. And we have pricing information as well. Now, obviously, this has been a story that we've covered since that original trailer came out back in 2018. And it's a project that's kind of been, you know, fraught with a lot of problems. There's been a lot of things have done wrong. But, I mean, the good news is the hardware is real. We've now got a release date. Apparently, it's getting manufactured now. We're expecting that if you want to go out and get a new Atari VCS PC-based console, you're going to be able to pick one up in time for Christmas this year. But, I mean, looking at the pricing of it, apparently for, like, the top-end one, you could be talking nearly $400 for it. Ouch. Which, actually, their timing was pretty rubbish on this because uh, they announced that if you're going to get it with the classic joystick, modern controller, um, the 8 gigabyte version with 32 gigabytes of storage, it sets you back $390. But also the rumor is that that is going to be the same price that the Xbox One Series S and the PlayStation 5 are going to retail for. Um, so there's I a mean, bit of competition there. Yeah, and the fact that, like, I mean, I'm not a technical guy. Uh, and when you just look at a console, like something modern coming out, and you're like, oh, it's got a 32 gig hard drive when like the playstation 5 is having like an 850 gig one and the xbox yeah. series x is like having a terabyte you're just like it's it's just going to kind of fall into that obscurity and only super fans are going to buy it let's be honest like that's how i feel about it you, you know, know it's going to be one collecting dust at dan's house like. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you see like some outdated system or some system that does technical specifications and they put like mouse and keyboard support yes it's like, of course it has mouse and keyboard support. That's not one thing you should be putting in the specifications. Like, it's great that we support mouse and keyboard. It, that's kind of a thing that you do when you're releasing, like, an Amiga product or something that's not really yeah. going to be huge. I, I find yeah. it quite odd. There, there are some nice things, like they've made the RAM replaceable. That's good that it's not a, a set version of RAM, but there's a lot of things in here that they're shouting about, like... Mm. Cross game chat, Skype, Discord, like cross you can yeah. <laughs> you can run Discord. It's, Great, it's like you it's know. Like in a, you know when you used to get like a cheap shovelware Xbox 360 game and free, you know, back like ten years ago, and you'd look at like the things on the back, and it would say, "Yes, achievements." <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. like every other game, <laughs> just just makes me think they haven't got much to talk about if they're yeah. like mouse and keyboard support. Yes. Oh God, L LED light up on and off button. <laughs> Second screen, screencasting. Yes, like everything does screencasting. My phone does screencasting. 
Well, you know, interestingly, I mean, a lot of people have kind of been saying that, you know, your phone is more powerful than this product. If you've got like, you know, a recent iPhone, for example. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen any like benchmarks of this system yet, but based on the, the AMD Ryzen system on a chip that's in there, some people have kind of been putting it on maybe like Xbox 360 kind of performance. Okay. So, I mean, if you're comparing that price-wise to a PS5, you're talking something that's two generations older mm. in terms of performance that's going to be retailing for the same price. I mean, I imagine if you want to buy an Atari VCS, you're probably a different market to someone who's going to buy a PS5. But yeah. I think, you know, even though this is essentially, we've talked about it before, it is a PC in a fancy case. And not even a really high-end PC, a pretty average spec PC. Uh, a but, Linux machine as well, really. Yeah. yeah. It, with, with like a custom skin and some and like they're just saying games. stuff like built-in web browser like come on guys it's 2020 yeah. <laughs> you know like yeah that should I, mean, I, lo- I love the look of it like listed as a feature you know? i mean i love the look of it and the, the case and everything the design i do like and i mean for like you know 90 quid maybe i'd pick one up as like yeah. a nice yeah. media center or something but when you're asking like 400 dollars for it i think i don't know i'm, I'm looking at this and thinking they're going to struggle now and like I like voice commands with a four, a four front facing mic array. Like, why have you not just made it so it reacts with Alexa or one of those kind of things, rather than have a full mic array that kind of picks up your voice and all this custom stuff? It, yeah, it seems like they're just chucking features at it. Yeah, I think it's going to be a tough sell. I mean, a lot of people are kind of been saying it's, um, you know, Atari have made the Ouya 2, but the Ouya only costs £99. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. That was a bit I, of an impulse buy. I, I wasn't expecting this to be like 390 quid or whatever it is. Like, I wasn't yeah. expecting that at all, you know, to play some old Atari games <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> you know, it's like, a case separate, that... you'll make more money, I think. Yeah, yeah well, that's yeah. the thing. I mean, we were talking the other week about that um, Raspberry Pi kit that you can get, you know, if you get the, the high-end Raspberry Pi 4, chances are that'll probably be higher performance than this anyway. Yeah. And you can put it in like a, a cute little Atari case <laughs> and yeah. you know, all the ROMs, like you fit that SD card. So you can probably do the same thing for about, hundred pounds at most so i think you know apart from selling that custom case there's not really a lot here that's going to entice i mean i'm struggling to find the audience for it i mean even or, retro or even gamers. the killer the killer app or the killer yeah. uh, game you know if there was so, something I mean, uh, like oh we're, we're gonna have you know jeff minter's latest title exclusive or, or something like that that may be a bit of a draw but i i can't see any of that at the moment yeah, I mean, I guess we'll find out what their plan is when it comes out. We've now got the release date, November 27th, of course. We'll keep an eye on that. And if you want to find out more, I'll link that up in our show notes and everything else we talk about this week at theretrohour.com. Now, Worms is obviously one of the best two-player games or multiplayer games of all time, actually. And it was actually quite good timing with uh, everyone being in lockdown that you might want to have an online two-player game with your mates. They've announced a new Worms game is coming out, and this is called Worms Rumble. Now, Worms Worms has always been a franchise that has been a little bit hit and miss for me. I love the original games, and, you know, Worms Deluxe is one of my all-time favourite Amiga games. And then I didn't mind some of the later ones, but when it kind of went into that, the 3D kind of gameplay, I wasn't a big fan. But actually, some of the recent ones have been all right again. And this one, of course, now, obviously, everything's copying off Fortnite. This is going to feature Battle Royale mode in there, too. But they've actually gone back to kind of the 2D kind of look. I am going to sound like a right miserable <laughs> guy on this week's episode. But um, I, I love the, the, the Worms titles. And they, they did go awry and kind of... There were ones where you had to collect tokens and stuff to, to get stuff. And I really wasn't into that. But Worms WMD was a bit of a a return to form. But this Worms Rumble seems to kind of take the element of Worms that I enjoy most out of the game. They might have done it fantastically, but they're ditching the kind of turn-based yeah, gameplay. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. It's 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 real time, isn't it? Like, yeah. So it reminds me of, I mean, I've not seen any screenshots of anything like that, so I'm glad to hear that it's still that 2D look. But it reminds me of, you know, Plants vs. Zombies when they went from their like original kind of like what the game was to like a 3D 3D kind of like person get third person game so I was worried it was going to be something like that but I I didn't even think that it was going down that vein of like Fortnite and like Warzone. Well there is a trailer video that I'll link up that you can check out as well. They're actually showing real time combat with 32 player teams. So, I mean, it does kind of look like the camera's moving all over the place and it's like, you know, there's action going on in every corner of the screen. So it looks a bit like, you know, a bit like mayhem on screen, I guess. But 
the one thing I, I think is, you know, I, I guess they've got to think of something new. They can't just keep making the same Worms games that they made 25 years ago every year. Yeah, I think, I, I, for me, it's it's what makes Worms unique, that competitive mm. kind of vibe. When you see someone and they're about to do something amazing and they completely mess it up and all the other players are just laughing or, you know, somebody does something really cool and it's that kind of seeing it, but also it's a very kind of slow-paced game on that so maybe maybe this will improve it but to be honest i thought that was one of the best moments of worms and like previously they've had worms wmd and they've added tanks and stuff like that and vehicles but it's it's not really that innovative you know like it would be cool to see oh, i've always dreamed of a music festival where everyone can log on their phone and play like ten thousand people on a match of worms <laughs> that, well, now that, all no, music that, festivals are virtual true. that could happen i guess yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well another product that's had a release date announced as well over the last week now this is something else that we've talked about for a while the poly mega is apparently going to be out in november at the latest or maybe even a little bit earlier if they can get them manufactured in time now this is a system i mean we'll do a little recap for people that might not remember the story when i think we talked about it about what two years ago now this essentially aims to be the only retro gaming console that you'll ever need. And it supports stuff like um, NES, SNES games, Mega Drive, Neo Geo CD, the Sony PlayStation. If I remember, there's a bunch more in there as well. And it really means that you only need one box that will connect up to your modern TV, one set of controllers, and you can play all your retro games, your original games, on this device. Uh, yeah, I saw that there was a preview version of this, which was um, on MVG's channel. And it looked like quite a nice device, actually. You you have to buy separate units um, for the different systems. So they're going to slowly release all of them throughout time. But um, you can play a lot of the original carts in it. And it's kind of like this stack system. I, I like the concept. Let's see how well it works. Well, apparently they, they were trying to get it out earlier. But obviously, like everything else, there's been manufacturing issues with their COVID and factories closing down around the world. They reckon that apparently they're aiming for November 15th as a release date now as well. But what is interesting is it didn't originally support Famicom carts. And uh, someone tweeted them asking for that and they said there'll be news on that soon. So I think, like you said, the fact that it's like a modular system, I guess if they get enough demand, they can probably just release editions for any systems that people demand, I guess. Yeah, and then tweak them, uh, update the firmware and stuff. But the the kind of videos that have come out already about the Polymega are pretty positive, and it looks like quite a cool system for those people that really want to have a nice, you know, HD output and uh, be able to play the original stuff in there as well. No, it is cool, and I think especially for people, like you said, you know, that want to play their original games and cartridges, there is something sometimes a bit more satisfying about plugging a cartridge in rather than just, you know, picking something from a big list of downloaded games, I think. I think Joe probably um, doesn't remember it because it changed names a couple of times. Oh, okay. Uh, I was going to say, I'm looking at this, and I'm just like, I don't recognize this at all. Like, <laughs> we've been yeah, talking it was, about it. It was always a modular system, but I, I remember they had original name and then it changed. And then oh, okay. And changed a few designs and stuff. Yeah. And yeah, to be no, fair, there is like, you know, modern retro systems that we seem to talk about every week, but yeah. <laughs> I think out of all of them, this one does look pretty cool. I mean, this one's just caught my eye looking at it now because it's got the Neo Geo CD drive on it. Like, that's the only reason it's caught my eye. And I was like, oh, I should pay attention to this. <laughs> Joe's writing his list to Santa right now. as we I said. am, I am. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we chat to Citrix, our special guest this week, let's talk about the Dreamcast. I mean, you know... We, we always talk about the Dreamcast on this show. It's one of our favourite systems collectively, a system that we always think deserved a bit more love than it got back in the day. But quite thankfully, it's actually, you know, it gets a lot of respect from the retro gaming community today. But maybe you look at your Dreamcast and think, I'd like to give that a bit more power. I'd like to soup up my Dreamcast. Well, actually, now there's a guide that's been printed that you can actually follow if you want to upgrade your Dreamcast RAM from 16 megabytes to 32 megabytes. So... You might be looking at this and thinking, well, what reason have I got for wanting to double the, the RAM in my Dreamcast? Obviously, it's going to mean that stuff like homebrew and emulators can take advantage of that extra memory in there. And I know, Ravi, in particular, you're always up for like, you know, modding systems and stuff like that. Oh, this kind sure. of opens a few doors, I think, to things that maybe weren't possible previously on the Dreamcast. Yeah, so this looks really interesting. Actually, it's 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 quite easy to do if you're a, a bit of a solderer. It's basically uh, diverting these pins so that more SD RAMs are dressed. Um, 
it seems cool. It's not actually supported in any games because I don't think they made any games to support 32 mega RAM, but mm. it seems to be supported for homebrew and emulators, which is pretty cool. And there's an article here on um, RetroRGB.com, and they're talking about the fact that this could maybe lead to Naomi ROMs being supported on the Dreamcast as well, because now the, there'll be enough memory to fit them in. Oh, cool. That that would be really good. Yeah. What was Naomi? It was the arcade version, yeah. wasn't it, before the Dreamcast? Yeah, it, it was the arcade version, essentially, wasn't it? Yeah, so you can end up getting some arcade ROMs on your kind of original Dreamcast hardware. That would uh, be pretty good. That is pretty cool. I was literally just like reading through the article, and I was thinking to myself, like, most homebrew games I kind of see for the Dreamcast are usually just like really souped up 2D fighters or 2D beat 'em ups. But I guess if it's opening up that, so you could play like the kind of like, you know, like the original Soul Calibur, how, you know, the arcade version of it and stuff, that'd be really cool. And the Dreamcast has always been a system that you can do quite a lot with. I mean, the homebrew seems massive on it, isn't it? And obviously, mm-hmm. there's like, you know, different emulators and things you can get for it. And uh, I think the fact that it was opened up so early means that it's had like, you know, 20 years of kind of independent development on it. So, and the scene's still really active today. I mean, what was that we were reading? I think like the year before last, I think in 2018, there was more Dreamcast homebrew releases that year than actual games had come out since 2001. So it's like, you know, the scene's still really active. And I think if, you know, they're going to be releasing emulation and ports and stuff that will take advantage of having double the RAM in there, you know, it could really knock our socks off, actually, the kind of things they can do with that. I even saw a video this week by Adam Kirillik about a new Dreamcast game that had come out. So, yeah. <laughs> Adam's always a go-to man, isn't he, if you want to find out what's happening in the world of Dreamcast? He's the dude. So before we get into our chat with Citrix, let's just give a big thank you to this week's supporter, our very good friends at ExpressVPN. Now, maybe you're working from home at the moment, or maybe you're back in the office and a lot of people around the world have started going back into work. There might be things that you want to do on the internet that you don't want other people to know about. Now, there's various reasons that you might want to improve your privacy online. Maybe you've got like a business plan that you're working on, you want to keep to yourself. Well, you might be thinking, why don't I just use incognito mode on my browser? The thing about it is, a lot of people think incognito mode means that you're private, it doesn't actually hide your activity because your internet service provider can actually still see everything that you're doing. And there have been stories about ISPs around the world that can actually legally sell your information to advertising companies. I know something's all, that's always bugged you, hasn't it, Ravi, that they can do that? Yeah. And also like if you're joining an unsecure network, so if you're joining a network like a hotel or yeah. a coffee shop, then people can actually sniff your packets and see what you're actually doing. And if you've got sensitive information, if you're doing uh, financial transactions or you're kind of, you've got work on there that you don't want other people to see, then 100% you need to VPN up and kind of get yourself protected. So what I do is on my laptop, I have ExpressVPN. So whichever network I connect to, straight away, it automatically starts up, minimizes, and then, I just don't need to worry about other people in the area. You know, you can even have the guy that you're sitting across the room drinking coffee from kind of sniffing all your information. It's uh, a really insecure, actually, some of these uh, networks. So having ExpressVPN on there, that's an app that reroutes your internet connection through their ultra-secure servers, and even your internet provider can't see what site you're visiting. It keeps all of your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. And like you said, I mean, most of the time, you don't even realize that you've got ExpressVPN on. It runs seamlessly in the background, really simple to use. Tap one button and you're protected. And you can run it on all your devices as well. You know, if you're on your phone, your laptop, your computer, your smart TV, there's no excuse not to be using it. So all you have to do, if you want to try out ExpressVPN, on us, get three months free on a one-year package. And of course, you'll be helping out the podcast by doing it. Visit this website address right now, expressvpn.com forward slash retro. That's expressvpn.com forward slash retro. Thanks to our good friends at ExpressVPN. Yeah, you don't want strangers sniffing your packets. (laughs) <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't want that. <laughs> right then, now before we get into our interview, let's just give a big thank you to our very special donators. Now, of course, we do have a Patreon running at the moment. You made a really good point, actually, last week, Ravi, that the reason we have a Patreon is because we want to reinvest every penny that we make through that back into the podcast. Yeah, totally. So a lot of people have patrons and they just usually use it as income. And, you know, with that, we're offering... Fantastic perks like ad-free episodes and, you know, exclusive content and there's different tiers on there. But what we want to do is actually take this patron money and build a studio, have a 
physical space and we're not going to build it from bricks and mortar. We just mean that we're going to actually <laughs> get in a space. Um, Dan's got quite a lot of the equipment already, which is fantastic. So this money's kind of going to go to renting a space and being able to help us produce more content. So, you know, we can put out other podcasts, we can do some video work from there, and also we can help really improve the quality because at the moment our studio space, we can't get in there because of COVID at the moment. But also if we're doing recordings like from Australia, like this week's episode in the morning, then uh, we'll be able to come into the studio and do that. So, uh, you know, it's really going to help out the podcast and ensure it has a good future. Yeah, because I've been doing the show from home. I mean, I'm in the studio on my own at the moment um, because if I did the show from home, I'd have my puppy barking in the background. He's every got a new seconds. dog, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we often have to stop recording because Ravi's cat wanders in the background or Joe's missus might shout him because he hasn't took the bins out or something. So <laughs> it is going to be nice if we could all get back together in our own studio, like you said, dedicated retro studio. And we can get guests in from all around the world. People can come in. I mean, if you're ever in Nottingham, we can come visit us, hang out. We'll have a space where we can do the show from. And of might course, even be able to do video. Yeah, I mean, it's an investment in the future of this show, really. So every penny that we earn through Patreon, we guarantee is going to go back into the future of this podcast. And of course, for making a donation into there and supporting us, you will get a shout in a future episode in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Like this week, thank you very much to Mike Thorpe. Steve Engeldow. Henrik Lagford. Stephen Quinn. And Julian Shepard who all made donations into our Patreon. Really appreciate that, guys. And, of course, we've got another Patrons Hangout coming up very soon as well, and probably next week, and I imagine Sunday night. So we'll put all the details to that on our Patrons um, page as well if you want to join us on there. Always a bit of a giggle on a Sunday night. We all get together, chat about retro games. Any questions you've got, you know, just a really good bunch of guys. We get together, just proper nerd out about retro things. So you'll find all the information for that and everything else on our website at theretrohour.com. Right, we'll have more news for you on next week's show. And coming up in a minute, then we are going to be joined by C Tricks from Debug Live, talking about chip tunes, making them, performing live. He'll be our special guest on the Retro Hour podcast next. You're listening to the Retro Hour, and I'm here with C Tricks. How you doing, mate? I'm very well, thanks, mate. How are you? Awesome, awesome. Well, we always kind of start our interviews with, you know, what was your first computer or what was your first gaming experience? But I'm thinking, because this is a sound interview, we'll go on to what was the first computer sound you heard or the first tune that really got you hooked? Well, I guess I sort of grew up with uh, listening to uh, music in the car, as I think a lot of kids did with their, you know, their parents just playing stuff. And I was quite lucky my folks uh, would get those now compilation uh, tapes, which is a very UK thing. <laughs> For anybody internationally who's never heard of them, they're like, uh, you get these uh, tape we used to in the 80s, these tapes that were uh, like a, a compilation of all the sort of, uh, you know, top 40 stuff. But they were quite good in including, you know, some of the electronic stuff and hearing uh, groups like Propaganda and Pet Shop Boys and things like that. And that was the stuff I liked listening to. So I was like, oh, we need more of this. And so my folks would sort of go out and find some stuff along those lines to listen to. And, um, you know, I was maybe three or four. And that was like, you know, that was my thing. That was my jam. So at about the same time, we got a, a C64. So, I mean, I was really just like, you know, I would just like have the game and then I'd just wait on the screen, you know, and listen to the music because I was like, this tune's really good. <laughs> so it was really a combination of what was happening, I guess, in the UK with that uh, that UK sort of pop electronic sound and, um, and yeah, also just having a Commodore 64 and, and vibing out on all of those amazing tunes, you know. Because you get that kind of stock ache in a Waterman sound on the uh, now that's what I call music, but you'd also get the occasional rave or dance track chucked in there as well and that was the stuff that was like there's that track on there it's like what is that so as a very young and there was unfortunately we didn't get the best radio receptions uh in the world but there was a couple of radio stations you could tune into and they're a bit fuzzy but you'd also get you know the more house sound or something um uh but you know i had a really crappy little radio clock by my bedside table um, you know, it was the first thing, real thing I ever got for my birthday. I was like, I want a radio clock. You know, that was, that was a thing in the eighties to have a radio clock, you know? So, and that allowed me to tune in and just listen at night. Um, but oh, you know, just super fuzzy background. I was just yearning for it, but I, I, it wasn't until I was maybe eight or nine that I really got, you know, the technotronic and, um, you know, pump up the jam sort of stuff. And that was when I was like, right, this is, <laughs> this is good. Yeah, I remember the uh, first time I heard Prodigy Experience on a tape. I yeah. was just like, whoa, 
what is this? <laughs> you know, it was great. Um, what kind of stuff were you doing on your dad's C64 then? Oh, we had a program. It was a very early musical program called, uh, I think it was just C64 Composer. And it was it was hellish to use. I'm going to do a video on it soon um, just to revisit uh, <laughs> how I like did anything uh, and used the joystick. Um, it was the kind of program that would have advocated a mouse, uh, but you used a <laughs> joystick instead, uh, you know, to draw notes on a staff. But it had this mode you flipped into that had all of the ADSR and the band pass filters and all of that. And you could tweak around with that and make all of these wild sounds. And I guess I spent a lot of my time just playing with that screen. I'd put a few random notes in. I didn't really care so much what they were, but I just, you know, would play with the setting screen just to try to figure out what all of these weird shapes and what's the square one versus the weird, you know, mountain one. What what did they all, why did they all sound different? And, you know, I hit this rezo button and it did something else really weird. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I just knew I liked to play. So, so that was totally pre-tracker as well. It was, that was a kind of different yeah, that would, interface. That would have been 1985, 86. So pretty early. Yeah, probably 86, actually. Pretty early in the, the C64, um, you know, me having one and being able to twiddle with it. I don't even know how we got the software, um, but I, Dad from work somehow got it. I mean, my folks knew I was into music because I was playing piano from a very young age. So, you know, it was sort of obvious, oh, we got a computer. Well, let's get something that says music in the title. <laughs> well, were you kind of exposed to the demo scene at the time and and and, and did you wonder like what are these flashy things on the screen <laughs> oh, the crack stuff yeah i mean we didn't have that much. i had a few crack throws on stuff and it was pretty cool i do remember like stopping and listening to the tracks and um <clears throat> and a couple of really cool loaders as well but i guess you know you like it was cool and it sort of went in passing but you didn't really i didn't dwell on it at the time um uh, it was uh, it was a, a bit later um, that I got into the tracking and the sort of demo scene stuff because the other thing is we didn't have a, a modem or anything. People forget that to have a BBS access was super expensive. So yeah, it was only kind of the discs that your friends would have and uh, the kind of stuff that you'd see. You know, it would keep that culture a bit limited until you actually had somebody who had access to a BBS or, or was online. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it was when we had a family friend who uh, had access that uh, we used to go around for dinner and I'd just be like, you know, grab the guy and I'd be like, come on, I need I need all your stuff that's to do with mod file and to do with the demo scene. And yeah, that was second reality really when I, when I hit that, but that was well into tracking. So early on, like, you know, I was very much that C64 inspiration, but not really knowing what I was doing so much which is an interesting way to approach it but i was also starting to program basic and wanting to do this when i was like maybe six um and wanting to do sound and stuff and there was just these really confusing poke commands that i didn't really know what was happening either but i knew that i could copy used to get magazines like these mad magazines uh that would have uh like you put a coding list in and it would give you uh, part of a computer game or you know you would get these little how to program books and i would just flip straight to the sound part and just try to figure out the lines that would make the sound um, so I'd have these fragments of poke commands, not having no idea of memory mapping or anything like of the complex stuff and just be manging around trying to make the Commodore 64 <laughs> make any old sound like, you know, <laughs> for hours. It was just like, make a sound, come on. Well, what point did you actually get a machine and and then start composing on your own? Um, <clears throat> that would have been, uh, I suppose, a bit later on. We always had a, I was quite lucky, we had a um, this Technics grant. It was like a... Um, uh, electric piano kind of thing but it had a four-part recorder on it so you could actually record and then save your track on a floppy disk so for years that was really how i composed i was just composing on the hardware on that um, but it didn't have a step sequencer or anything and you could never get anything tight it was always like as you played it and it wasn't even as a kid like i was listening to you know the technotronic and the pop up the jam and stuff and just like you know oh, i want to get that sort of like big chunky sound and there's just all these preset like clavitones and stuff it just wasn't really <laughs> making the sound i wanted and I was like, how do i get that sound um and that was when i came across it was um uh, i saw an amiga actually uh, i remember donkey's years ago a friend well i saw one oh the commodore expo like when i was a kid and i remember seeing that and going wow but then three or four years later i was at a friend's house uh, and yeah, his dad had an Amiga and I, I heard that and I was like, right, what is that? How is that working? And they showed me it was like an early primitive tracker. And I remember hammering a few notes into that and going, right, I need to find this. Um, but <laughs> not having an Amiga at the time, uh, it was really 
like, I need to find this for PC. <laughs> and there was a really terrible piece of software called ModEdit that worked through the PC speaker. Um, and even though I had an early sound blaster, didn't actually come through the sound blast. So I ended up hooking my PC speaker into like a external amplifier. And it was like always a bit of contention. <laughs> like my dad, like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but, wow, that, that, that must have been a really loud as well. <laughs> if you had an external amp, the PC yeah. speaker. Well, you turn it down, yeah, because it was five volts, so it was bad, and it would distort a bit. But when I played it back, I had playback software for mods for playing them back through the sound blasters. It was just when I was composing them, they sounded like really crunchy, and there was these high speed squeals and stuff, or high like pitch squeals in the background. And and then after learning that for a while, so it was a program called Mod Edit. It was very early, but it was all I could get because you know I just went to my local shareware store and um, and they just had this thing called Mod Edit, and I was like, well, that's got to be a mod editor <laughs> like the guys at the store didn't know what it was you know yeah you used to have shareware stores with just floppy disks everywhere and you just like flip through them with your two dollars pocket money you know one pound pocket money trying to find a floppy that had the software that you needed you know <laughs> i i had exactly the same experience we had a, a kind of a, a piracy store i'd say <laughs> and i'd be uh sitting on my knees flipping through all the disks trying to find something decent to use yeah, and it's it's funny people don't realize like before if you didn't have access to uh, that whole BBS scene, which was really only a very small part of the population, the majority of people at, did go hard like you know floppy disks. So, so you were actually making mods on the four eight six then. Um, what was it like when you put well, them on was, the yeah, Amiga on the SX twenty five? Well, I had a friend who had the Amiga too, so I would go around and his place and actually like have a twiddle and play you know for an hour or so here and there and i eventually managed to borrow their old 500 for a little bit of time as well and um oh nice so i did sort of have semi access to amiga here and there and the thing was just like it was night and day on the amiga i mean it just sounded so much better and i didn't know for years why until later on when i got one and i, I did some research but you know it was it was at, like very obvious that the, the amiga had something more going on under the hood um, and of course it was actually just the Amiga was how it was supposed to sound. And the sound blaster was always truncating it back to eight bit and stuff like, you know, it was, uh, it was doing a very crude playback, but I didn't know that for a long time. Well, well I, I did, but I, I didn't understand why till much later. It's, it's weird when you look back on it, isn't it? Because when, when I was younger, I thought, you know, oh, the, the, the CRT monitors, the graphics look absolutely amazing and the sound looks amazing. And I think was that kind of rose tinted glasses when I was a kid, but now you actually go back to these machines and and they sound so clear and really really amazing actually. Yeah, well, this was the thing, and and I guess this is with chip music. What a lot of people have realised. I mean, you take something like I mean, the classic is the Atari twenty six hundred, the nineteen seventy six Pong machine, basically, but with with a little bit more functionality. Um, you know, it's got a few sprite fields, and it's got a. It doesn't have. It's got 128 bytes of memory. Like that's not that's not much. <laughs> and you know, but yet you get the sound chip on that, and then you chuck it through a big PA system, and it's huge, and it's clean, and it's like, wow. I remember the first time I modded uh, Atari 2600, and then I powered it on in the studio, and it went bang when I turned it on. I was like, oh fuck! And then I was like, turning up the volume, I couldn't hear anything. I was like, there's no hiss on this. And then I pressed play, and it just like the loudest like hugest sound i was like wow <laughs> it's probably one of the highest quality devices i have in terms of silent noise floor and just super full range sound you know and it's that kind of weird analog digital kind of crossover with it, it it's sounding like you've plugged a synth in or something yeah no absolutely and um I was, if i fire up a track right now from the atari You know, it's just that it's it's so digital, but it's so uh, like it is like you say a synth. It's that experience of definitely hearing something that's big. You know, and it, it's got that range as well. Yeah, uh, which I think other things don't have anymore because you know I've I've seen people DJing or playing on on other systems and it it's kind of all in the mid and it hasn't got the real highs or the the real nasty lows. 
Well, it sort of depends how you, I guess, sort of mix and master things. But I guess with these machines, like, um, I mean, if you look at how the Atari makes it sound, it's a very, it's kind of squarish in the way it sort of turns stuff on and off very quickly and does like sort of rapid pulses of stuff. Um, but it's always going to have that because it's kind of, it does volume up and down as well. It does actually draw some pretty incredible waveforms, but it, it just makes such a sharp sound when it, but it, it's slightly angled because of the speed of the silicon. And that's, that's funny because you're starting to hear that it's still in the era where you hear the, the physical limitations a little bit of what the thing can do like uh, on a, on a voltage level. So it, it's just, there's so many reasons why these old machines have just got character that you don't find it's nuance it's very subtle nuances but you know yeah you miss yeah, that i find uh i find even with like modern music at the moment people will be trying to produce like 80s synthy stuff and they'll be producing it on a, a new piece of equipment and it just won't sound the same as the kind of original kind of sound well, and a lot of it is it's <clears throat> it gets slightly overproduced, and I found this a little bit. Um, I mean, I did buy Omnisphere, which is like a fairly big collection of stuff, um, and it's got some great stuff, but everything is very uh, oversampled and very like uh, like pure and like big. But when you uh, like have it all together being digitally mixed from multiple instances, it just kind of layers in a very um, like every time it triggers or plays, it's 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 the same kind of phase or the same. It's hard to describe, but it doesn't sound the same as getting like a Prophet, a DX and a drum machine and putting it through a mixer and taking the line out. And that sounds softer and less punchy, doesn't have that same, you know, modern big production values, but it has a sound about it that's different. It's very different. So, and a lot of that is to do with the way things mix and, and things engineer together. So I guess, you know, you and, and there's so much effort to try to simulate all of that on modern computers, yet, Everybody just, I think, pushes it and overproduces, like, you know, because they want it to sound big on a sound system. But, you know, you've got your sound engineer for that who's, you know, should be tweaking that. <laughs> well, when you started to get into the demo scene, like, were there any musicians that you were looking up to? Were there any really standout demos or intros that yeah. uh, the music just kind of blew your mind? The first uh, like thing on the Amiga that I came across, uh, and also on the PC, because it was a PC port, was Pinball Dreams, um, was one of the first mods where I was like, right, well, this is incredible. And the introduction sequence, which turned out to be uh, Blazer from TPL, um, the Black Lotus. I'm actually wearing the T-shirt, right, TBL T-shirt today. You know, they had these crossovers to the demo scene. And so that was where I was like, and I started looking inside the mod files, ripping the mod files from... Uh, Amiga game. So I'd actually go to my mate's place who had an Amiga and I would use ripping utilities to rip out mods and to grab just the music. Uh, and then I would go home and listen to the music and, you know, and pull it apart and and check it out. And yeah, and, and, and there was also Lemon was another artist and there was Flesh Brain was another artist and there were, there was a bunch of them. Uh, Skaven now, was Skaven or was it Purple Motion? Or was it, a couple of them did a couple of mods as well. So there was that on the, the Amiga. There was a bunch of other kind of artists I'd come across as well um, and the RSI guys and things. And then, yeah, on the PC, there was the obviously the uh, people like uh, Future Crew and uh, Jura oh, Jurassic, oh, what were they called? A bunch of the early guys anyway where I had a, a probably five or six key demos which I, I managed to source and that was hugely inspirational um, just to A, watch to have this visual element with it but also just to listen to these really cool trancey tunes which – Luckily, that was the point where I was able to start listening to uh, like uh, later and later at night and discover, oh, okay, so this is where all the good music happens on the radio. And that's, you know, where I started getting into the electronic stuff. So, but it was actually, I heard it on the, from trackers first, I would have been probably about 11. Oh no, it would have been less than that. It would have been probably nine or 10 first. And I would have heard it from trackers first um, before I then discovered community radio and late night dj shows <laughs> you you're right about the mods as well because being able to rip the samples from there and kind of take them apart uh, was really important and you can't do that with many other formats unless you you find a clean drum in there or you find a, a section where no other instruments are being played well that was a huge thing yeah and um there's a, st a sort of bit of a standard joke i guess that some of my early tracks like had sounded like something straight out of Pinball Dreams. It's because I was using those samples. That were the samples I had. And it, and and that thing of being able to share, and that was like early on, it really taught me the the massive beneficial, be, beneficial side of open source, you know. And 
I mean, not that it was open source, it was public domain. And, and people did say, well, you, you knew you weren't just going to copy someone's track straight out. But to be able to take those instruments, suddenly, you know, you get yourself a nice little house track from, you know, Euphoria or one of those crews. And then, you know, you've got a kick drum and you've got a beat and then you've got like, you know, some vocal stabs and some, you know, stuff that's been sampled from, uh, you know, in a city or whatever. And yeah, suddenly it's like, oh, I've got, I've got these sounds. And then that mixed with the stuff you've taped off the radio where you, you know, you'd get a recording of a cold cut track or something and you'd just be like playing in and isolating their instruments and things like that. It was a really nice combo of your own stuff and other people's, you know, instruments from their tracks. And you knew if you put something out, you were sort of, it was almost like a badge of honor if somebody took your sound. So, Well, were you aware of a Aussie demo scene at all? Or did you think uh, all these tunes were kind of coming from Europe or America? Yeah, well, I knew they were sort of, because people are pretty proud about where their music's from. Um, and I used to get, it was really hard to, because I, I lived in a smaller country town in Australia. So it was you know, about a pound a minute or, you know, a dollar fifty US a minute to, you know, to have a BBS or like access. So you just didn't really dial into other pla you couldn't. Like it was just too expensive. So I would get stuff through very early on, I was very lucky we got a CD ROM drive, like a single speed one on the very first iteration of like multimedia. Because my folks knew I was so into it. And I was able to pick up um, some early the multimedia discs that were just full of, in inverted commas, public domain stuff. And it was like people just getting absolutely everything they could and shoving it on a CD. But there was one particular one in Australia um, that had managed to track down. They were obviously a demo scene nut. And to this day, I'm still trying to meet the person that did it because I've heard of them um, and, 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 and just thank them because they, they got things like chat logs from all the BBS boards of all the BBS part of like bunches of demo parties like um, assembly and stuff like 92 or the party and things. And they would just chuck those chat logs as text files. And I would just scroll through them and just read them like just hours of nonsense, like, you know, just pages of nonsense from a demo party, but just to try to learn and understand about different artists and musicians and what it was all about. So for me, it really was, yeah, very uh, European because the Australian scene was more about the the cracking side of things um, rather than uh, demos for a long time. I mean, there were some some demos and things that came out, but I wasn't aware of that till much later. Well, you ended up doing a kind of European demo scene tour at one point. <laughs> Could you tell us about that? Yeah, well, it was a case of I was slowly actually. It was when I just sort of turned eighteen or nineteen. I that's when I discovered there was a demo scene in Australia, and I was super excited and. Um, uh, was trying to, there wasn't a party locally in my city. So it was sort of the next city across, which is, oh, I mean, it's a long, Australia's big, so like eight hour drive. And I didn't have a car at the time and I couldn't get there. And by the time I'd got a car and I'd saved up money and I was like, right, I can go and check this demo party out. It, it finished. <laughs> and so I was like, <laughs> oh. So um, I was like, well, maybe we start a demo party in Australia. And I was talking to my friend and we're like, yeah, okay, cool. Well, let's go overseas and let's just check what's happening in Europe first. So, um, yeah, we went over to uh, Assembly Demo Party just because that was, you know, the one from uh, as a kid where all the classic stuff that I'd watched on the PC had first kind of like um, impressed me from. So I was like, well, we'll go to Assembly, we'll go to Evoke, we'll go to, there was another one. And, uh, yeah, we just went to these parties and, and just met these people and, yeah, suddenly, you know, here's your heroes, you know, just talking to you and everyone's really cool and chilled out and the, the guy who was running Evoke uh, Demo Party Triple X was just – had me as a guest up when one of the compo, I think it was the wild compos were on and I was just sitting overlooking the whole party and he was just giving me beers and we were just chatting about parties and he's like, yeah, just start a party and they will come. Like don't question it or think if you're cool enough or whatever, just do it and make, you know, just put the word, find a place, time and place and then put the word out. I, I just had so many good, so much good inspiration from that and so many good people um, who in retrospect are absolutely, you know, right about that thing. And that really set a precedent for me for running events from that point on. Is that where you got your name as well? Yeah, well, that was Commodore Tricks from, uh, oh, well, I was Zor when I was a kid. Like I had a totally different name. But I mean, there's so many people had that. It was like, oh, well, my handle's kind of like used. So I'd, I'd had that from uh, Commodore Tricks from something I'd done. I can't even remember where that came up, but I just shortened it to C-Trix. And this was like, I think at about 99 or not, it might've been 98 kind of thing. So I'd, I'd done stuff long before that, but just sort of like uh, under a, a different, I had a thing with my friend at high school that we were trying to program demos ourselves, but we weren't really able to do anything. <laughs> well, you kind of 
came back to the Amiga and started making mods, but uh, like in a more modern setting. Um, was that when you really started to get noticed by people in the European and general well, Amiga scene? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I there's a bit of a story behind that. I mean, when I was a kid, I did actually um, make uh, mod files. Like, uh, you know, uh, this sort of like, this is from when I was like 12 or 13. You know, I had this sort of, you know, sort of rocky kind of stuff, you know. Slack bass. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. So that kind of thing or this kind of like... Um Like that was when I was 11. So like I had these tracks from when I was a kid um, and then I'd done the odd track that was a little bit more uh, like, you know, out there. Like uh, I think when I was like 14, 15, I'd done this like, you know... Because I'd started listening to rave music and stuff on the radio. So... So I was sort of right into it when I was. You'll have to send me that one. It's good. <laughs> yeah, that's like Utah Saints sort of inspired that. Like I don't know, I just grabbed a bunch of stuff from all over the place and I'd mix up these, you know, really random uh, tracks, all these like, you know, you know, that, you know, too much, too unlimited sort of. So that was like my vibe. And it's, but the thing was, just as I was getting into that as a kid um, and sort of, you know, experimenting with that stuff, I got into metal and I got into prog rock and fusion and jazz and I started playing in bands. So I kind of put the Amiga stuff on the wayside a little bit to make room for all of that stuff. Um, and I was quite lucky, like we were winning Battle of the Bands and like playing like for a kid when uh, you're a kid, like playing like, you know, at the mid-sized festivals and stuff so you know i was balancing all of that as well as playing in orchestras and stuff with the schools thing so there was sort of like the the electronic stuff went on hold um and it was when i was i got into uni and uh everyone there just wasn't a lot of people playing in bands it was a lot of djs and people doing stuff and i was like i don't really want to dj i want to like play you know electronic music that i've written myself rather than dj because the dj equipment was very expensive um, so I, I bought myself a roll at this thing called a groove box, which for years like served me really well. It's this roll and sort of all in one production box and a sampler and doing techno y sort of stuff. Um, and that was super fun. So it was this kind of oh, well, there we go. So the first thing I did was a remix of Commando. So I was actually like, this was from before I'd gone back to the Amiga stuff, I was still doing chip stuff, but you know, I was like, um. Nice. So that, for instance, just to let you put context, that's played in the middle of a forest in the middle of winter outdoors in the middle of nowhere to about like 100 people, I guess, at a, a legal rave. Um, so <laughs> I was bringing this stuff like out there and, and like, you know, for fun, but it was very much in a remix sort of sense. It was just, just like, you know, just techno sort of... So uh, like I had that vibe and that that techno kind of thing that I was doing. And then one day, it would have been about 2005, I suppose, or four, um, I turned on my <laughs> my box uh, to work on something. And I can't remember what I was doing. I think what was in currently in memory, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah I'll just save this before I work on something. And I had it sitting on my knees because it sort of was an all-in-one box. And I moved and the power cable fell out just as I hit oh, snow. No. And I turned it back on. <laughs> and it was wiped. It was completely gone. So I'd MIDI dumped it all out, backed it up, but I went to restore it and nothing came back. It didn't work. Now, at the time, I didn't know this, but the MIDI dump had actually worked. I was just, I was just sending it out back to the unit incorrectly. But I just thought at the time, and at least for another like year after that, I've just lost, you know, five years worth of work on this box and my backups haven't worked. Like, you know, I, I don't have any tunes. I've got a show and I had a show three weeks later. So I was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to play? Because I don't even trust it. Maybe there's something wrong with the internal battery or something. I don't know if it's I'm going to lose all my tunes again. Like, what am I going to play off? What have I got that can make sound? And I had an Amiga that I'd got like a few years before that, that I'd had just kicking around, noodling around on for fun. And so I was like, well, maybe I'm just going to figure out a way to get all my old mods from the PC back across to the Amiga. Because at that point, I couldn't 
interface between the two. People forget it was quite hard to interface between a PC and an it Amiga. Was, it was like a serial cable, wasn't it? And all yeah. this crazy, crazy software. But I, I jumped in the deep end and bought a uh, 1200 because I only had a 500. And that had a, which at the time was cheap, like, you know, 100 bucks second hand. So I just got one and, um, and that had the ability to read PC discs. And um, yeah, and then I just shoved all my old tracks on and I was like, I better make a few new tracks to go with these old ones. I wonder if I can still track. And I jumped back into a Open MPT, which was a modern tracker. I think it was called Mod Plug Tracker back then. And I just, I remember I, I spent the first day tracking again and I just didn't go to bed and it was like 5 a.m., 6 a.m. The sun started coming up. I was like, <laughs> and then I literally just started canceling jobs, not going to uni, not to, like I just canceled everything and just spent two weeks tracking. And I wrote f- seven tracks. I wrote an entire set. Um, and then I took my 500 and my 1200 to that show and I played uh, this kind of live show um, that was, I guess, went down as, and people were just like, you've got to keep playing that stuff, whatever you just played is what you should be doing from now. And it was all of these like things that I'd worked on when I was a kid and half done and, and then I'd sort of come back to them. Uh, so like lots of these like, you know, So that old school kind of rave sound and I just went to town on it and at the time it was before that sort of was coming back I guess and um, you know and that party was just one of the wildest things I've ever done in my life and that became I guess the moment where I was like well maybe I should rock parties with Amigas from now on. Well the first time me and Dan kind of heard of you was when we went on YouTube and Dan's like check this video there's a guy playing amigas and everybody's going mental <laughs> it was like so awesome to see about 500 people in the club uh it was one of your horses remixes oh, yeah yeah you, yeah one of the <laughs> early videos that that was just amazing to see and you're right uh, that period kind of retro stuff wasn't massively big and uh it was it was a bit of a kind of lost lost genre no one was playing it anymore well, and, and the thing is, what I really love about, and this is what I discovered as soon as I started tracking, is um, I've always loved that concept of getting a computer or getting anything and pushing it to its limit of what it can do. And I was doing that with my group box already, that like rolling box that I had, that, and, and already pushing that to as far as I could. Like everyone else was buying all these additional add-ons and all these things and control layer. And I was like, no, I just want to do as much as I can with the one box. And I had that approach with the Amiga as well. And, um, and I guess having that five, six years in between of uh, doing a lot of electronic music and understanding how electronic music worked a lot more. I was I came back to the Amiga knowing what I wanted to do, but I had to find out how to make those sounds and how to do things like combinations of kick snares and drums and ducking around the audio to make things poke out. And so like, you know, that that changed my whole approach to tracking. And and I got very technical with my tracking. And then the funny thing was I started tracking on Game Boy and and Atari and Commodore and a bunch of others where I was using those same philosophies that I'd, I'd applied to the Amiga from doing electronic music before that. So I kind of reversed it in a way. A lot of people would track first and then they would move on to the, you know, the electronic live gear, whether it be samplers or, you know, uh, you know, performing with this in inverted commas professional gear where I had the professional gear first and then like went to back to the Amiga and uh, yeah, it's just it's just really fun because only having four channels as well, you've got to be very selective about what you use. And if you've got a rave pad, you know, that's front and center because that's 25% of your sound. You know, you put a drum in there and some hi-hats and you've only got one channel left to maybe do a crash or something. You don't have too much more space to work with. So you're always like thinking about what your parts are and trying to make them the best you can because you spend a lot, you'll spend an hour on a, five second loop because you get that's going to be the crux of your track and it's only one of four elements that are people going to hear so that concept of limitation is is a beautiful thing and it always looks absolutely insane when you're tracking like for someone who's not techie it looks like you're in the matrix or something (laughs) yeah it does and um and and to me it just looks like you're in absolute noodle land when you've got like vsts open all of place and you're doing it and i'm like how the hell do you guys work like that when you can't just see everything that's happening within like 
five centimeters of your screen like <laughs> yeah. you've got all you kind of learn to read it like music you know just seeing seeing the notes going and knowing what's happening and, yeah. oh yeah and i know and, and the new way of doing things is very like 3d like they've got like windows hiding people bringing up windows and closing windows and doing things and i just like lost I'm like, how can you even know <laughs> where something is you know so it's it's interesting i guess it makes you think a little differently well this kind of playing live has, has led to you touring worldwide so you've gone to mexico new zealand germany japan the netherlands australia usa and the uk out of those which has been your kind of favorite gigs and hungary as well um and italy and hungary um wow. <laughs> uh, in finland look i don't think there is a favorite show as such because they're all very different you know everything you play sometimes the smallest shows are the, the funnest uh, sometimes the the larger shows are you know fun as well. Probably uh, I had a pretty fun show years ago in London. It would have been about oh, six years ago uh, in Hack somewhere in Hackney, and that was just like a real bunker of a show, and it was just really fun, just slamming tracks and the lineup. Everyone was doing something new and showing their new tracks, and the audience just was ready for new tunes, and that was just fun. That was just like a real. I don't know, it would have been like 30 people, 40 people, but it was a great crowd. Uh, I played a show in Germany and I loved the Germans because <laughs> they were like, uh, you know, uh, how long do you want to play for? I was like, oh, I don't know. Like, how long do you want me to play for? They're like, well, how long can you play for? I was like, oh, if I played like a bunch of stuff together, it'd be like three hours. So, you know, and before I could finish the sentence, he's like, well, then you would play for three hours. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, like, really? He's like, yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and I played this freaking epic show. And that folder of tracks has been, because I it really made me sort out like an order. How do I go for three hours and go from synthwave right the way through to like hard drum and bass and like break core at the end? And how do I go on that journey? And now I just kind of pluck from that master list plus add my new tracks in to like, you know, order a set. It's like, okay, so which area of this set am I going from? But it was like insane uh, to to sit and play this show that was three hours and just slam through. I was almost like in a trance, you know, and after, because it takes you like 20 minutes to warm up and get into the vibe of a show sometimes. Yeah, like, for sure. The stage and the sound and the, the nervous and energy out and the crowds are sort of like getting the vibe. And so when you've got that bit longer, because a lot of chip shows, when we talk about like the chip scene, there's this half an hour kind of thing that's, uh, you know, a standard set. And I find that's like, you know, you can really get into it when it's like an hour. Um, and when it's three hours, it was just like, wow, this is this is crazy. <laughs> I, w- I was going to say, like, you're really good at getting into your sets and when you're performing, kind of having a hyper and ener- energetic kind of performance, being really into the sound. And I find that incredibly hard. Um, I just like look at my Amiga and get stuck in that, you know, ignore the whole audience and stuff. How how do you get into that kind of mindset? Well, a big thing for me is having con- like external surfaces to work with. So, I mean, I usually try to make it so I've got easy mute buttons for like my my kicks and snares and stuff, which I'm just out of Pro Tracker. It's just Alt and whatever it is, ZXCV, I think it is, to mute those four channels. Um, and then I always have filters, uh, kind of reverbs. and th- So there's there's a sort of performance that goes with a track of where things go in and where like, um, you know, bass cuts in and out and does things. I sort of know how they would play out in a live sense. And I just sort of make sure that I'm always doing something, but it's just enough that I can have a good time. And if I miss something, it's not the end of the world. So making it so it's easy and fun, but so that, you, I don't know, you can still just rock out and the, the crowd are into it because they, they can see you're busy and doing stuff, but you can still rock with the crowd if you want and not have to stress about, if you stuff miss something like it's just going to loop for a bit longer or whatever. So, and I don't know, it just, um, I, I just always like bopped along to my music, uh, even as- a, a, a few more knobs then I think and stuff to Twitter with. Yeah. And I, and I always just have it like, yeah, on an analog desk or, uh, yeah, the DJM 800, which is a standard mixing desk for me is great. It's got filters on it. So you can just, and just kick in, you get kind of good at hitting the button just before it kicks in and, and doing things like as you're doing build-ups, like you turn the volumes ever so slightly down to nine instead of ten, and then you squelch it, and when it kicks back in, you just flick them both up to ten again, and it's just like oh nice, the hard when it right. tips yeah. here. So there's lots of things like that that are just engineering. You're just engineering your set live, but as if the crowd are into it too, and you're into it, and everyone's having a good time, you know that's that's the ultimate really. So you you went to Blip Festival, and you know globally there was quite a few 
chip tune events going on and yeah. even even before covid they seem to have kind of slowed down a bit um yeah why do you think that is well i think that they were they're, they're still there just the big grandiose ones that get publicized more uh have just probably settled down a bit and that's just because it's quite hard and expensive and you know it's a mission to put shows on and, and it was the generation who were doing that was starting to get a bit older i guess and it wasn't i guess underground kind of electronic music had started to become a little bit more sort of known and things and I don't think anyone who's ever run one of these festivals has ever done it without. It gets to a certain size where it's quite stressful to run because your um, costs of getting artists over and the rest of it is just like, you know, it's quite expensive uh, and it's quite a lot of stress. And you're never going to get a massive amount of people. You're going to get a big crew of people. But if you look at the number of people you've got overseas and you've got people traveling in and stuff compared to like a big festival, you might have, you know, still eight artists, you know, coming and visiting as does a big festival, but they've got 20,000 people, you've got a thousand, which is still amazing, but it's really hard to pay for everything and cover your costs. So there's just like, you know, like just people burn out uh, and they just realized the formula worked better when you kept it to smaller sort of fun shows. And we've got one. Yeah, Mac Fest seems to be the uh, huge one at the moment. Yeah, and that's backed off the back of Magfest. Uh, so obviously they have entertainment, and it's just a combination that works pretty well to have you know chip music artists on, you know, on that Saturday night, which I've played, and it's a really fun show. But it's um it's very different to a chip music show. Like it's sort of more uh, everyone's just there to have a party, which is a great vibe. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's like you know it's not the same as having you still get all your friends on the front rows and stuff who are there like just like knowing what you're doing but there's a bunch of people who are just there to dance and jump around and be silly in their cosplay as well it's it's a different vibe <laughs> but the best vibe it's just totally it's not the same as having a nice group of 40 people where um yeah you people are heckling like you between tracks and you can talk between tracks and it's fun and you know it's, it's a very different vibe it's more of a punk vibe i guess when you're it's like electro it's like punk artists but retro imagine a crowd full of retro nerds <laughs> yelling <laughs> and joking around and people like just yelling out for you know tracks that they know you're not going to play and things like you know <laughs> well you don't just make c64 amiga and pc tunes as well you use like many different systems um i i, I even saw you doing stuff with the vec tracks recently yeah what's the kind of most fun system to work with? Oh, look, the Amiga's f f fun, uh, but that's really a digital sampler. Um, probably the most opportunity and the craziest in terms of what you can do, the Commodore 64 is still amazing because it's got filters and the Rezo stuff, and but there's so many people who are amazing at using it, and it's you almost have to be full-time. <laughs> um, but the Mega Drive has um, um, been pretty fun. Yeah, so, I mean, I've been doing stuff like... Uh, FM sort of based stuff, housey stuff. We'll never tire of so in the case of that that also has full vocal tracks running through it through the sample track and wow so and it's like a i was like well i got four meg worth of memory on a cart that i can use i may as well fill it with full vocals and things like that yeah so like the Sega is really fun, or the Sega, Sega Mega Drive, Sega Saturns. Oh, sorry, Sega Mega Drive, uh, Sega Genesis is what I'm thinking of. With the FM stuff, I guess you've just got a really nice uh, set of sounds to work with, you know, and it's great for electronic. And, you know, you can really cut through a sound system on it. The kick drum's really chunky. The hi-hats are really sharp and tight. Um, so yeah, FM is kind of like a lot of people are moving on to it at the moment, uh, from the old simple simplicity of the Game Boy and things like that. But see, the Game Boy is great because it's portable and you turn the power on and within two seconds, it actually, well, it went less, a second, it's back where you left it and you just keep writing music and it's like portable and it's in your hands and you've got a full piece of software that just runs on the Game Boy. So how do you compare that to running for the Mega Drive where you've got to have like, you know, a fairly complicated setup? It's it's a very different, it's like different systems for different situations. You can't sit on a bus and work on a, a Mega Drive track. Well, also you've kind of built a, a crazy piece of hardware, the uh, Guitari, oh, <laughs> which yeah. seemed to get a lot of press attention as well. Could you tell yeah. us more about that? 
Well, yeah, but it, it, it's funny. I can, but it, it's it's not really much more than the Atari 2600 with an audio output. All, <laughs> so basically, I wanted to do some stuff on the Atari um, because no one else was really doing it at the time much. And I was like, oh, what? what's the limit? Why is no one doing stuff on the Atari? And I was like, okay, well, there's no real software. Um, so I had to write a tool that sort of like took, I made it so that it took my tracker output and then converted that into assembly code. So it kind of cross-compiled a special tracker file in, back into code that would then run. But I discovered after about 20 seconds of playing back uh, music, because I had to play it quick enough to be able to do things like kick drums and like, because with a kick drum, you'd go really quick. If you speed it up quick enough, it becomes a kick drum. So you need to do stuff really quick and flip stuff around really quick to make the, you know, the sounds that sound more modern. Um, so by the time I did sped everything up, I just run out of memory instantly. So it was more of a coding exercise than anything, just to try to make some tracks on the Atari 2600. And um, and I'd got this this tracks going, and I was like, well, I really want to play it at because uh, I was playing at Blip Festival in New York, and I was like, I really want to play it, uh, but uh, like. Uh, if I've just got the Atari, like for starters, the level output was really high. So I was like, I can't really just feed that into a desk. I need to sort of drop it down. So I ended up with a, a slap bass EQ pedal from Boss. It's like this uh, it, like pedal that's used to taking super high pickup from a big bass guitar, slap bass guitar and dropping the level. So I had that as my drop pedal. And I was like, well, I really want something else to be able to hold notes if I'm doing stuff between tracks. So I added a delay pedal as well. I had this table full of crap and I was like, well, this is going to take me forever to set up. I need to mount it all to a board. So um, I literally was just going to chuck it all on a piece of wood. And then I was like, well, I may as well just flip it upside down and wear it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I was having a few beers with a mate and I was like, do you reckon this would work? And he's just like, that's the funniest thing I've ever seen. You should totally make that. And we just literally went down a well, Bunnings, which is our equivalent of whatever you have, Home Depot or whatever. And um, we just bought wood and Velcro and stuff and then just started drinking beers and built the Qatari. And it was just the funniest thing we'd ever seen. We're like, this is so dumb. <laughs> and so that it, it does look Qatari. truly awesome. <laughs> but it's not really. I mean, it's really just a replayer. And I have got a couple of routines where it'll loop and there's a couple of break points where I can jump out of the loop and continue the song. Uh, but apart from that, I mean, that's all I had memory for before, you know, I, I couldn't do anything more. So, And I'm yeah. loving that idea of kind of expanding your system with guitar pedals and, and different effects units and stuff like that. That's that's a really kind of smart way to, well, to yeah, add to add extras. variation. Yeah, because the problem was I was ending up with something that was just looping for, you know, uh, 30 seconds. It was like, well, how do I add some variation to loop? And if you just add delay, it's not so fun. But I was like, I want to just like do like... And this this old delay pedal that I've had since I was a kid, I used to play guitar, and it's like you hold, put it in the hold pattern, and then you turn the delay knob, and it just goes. It's not you're not supposed to do it. It's an artifact of the pedal, but um, it just sounds really good. And guitarists have done it for years. You know, just chuck a big squelchy delay and like turn the knob down. So I just was doing that through the track to add some interest. You know, to, to add some variation. It was. It's very much a need, you know. <laughs> um, but I've got like, you know, the tracks that I've done on that, you know. Do you hear how chunky they are? They just sound massive. This is a new one, but. And I guess they're more experimental as well. Yeah. And it just turns out that it's really banging. Like you get this through a big sound system. And especially with the sound engineer, and they just like they love it, and and you tell them at front, look, I'm not going to send anything that's like too harsh. Just just crank it, like crank the bait, let it go as hard as you can, and they're like, all right, um, and <laughs> give them free reign, and they go mad. Yeah, yeah, and uh, especially in Japan, the one that went online, um, you know, the sound of that show was just insane. It was the whole room was just shaking. It was this bunker of a club, and the whole place was just, yeah, they really went to town on it. So. Um, but yeah, so that was the guitar and I mean, it was really just for fun, but I put together a little video for it because it was just like, seemed like a fun thing and, you know, a thousand people watched it, a couple of thousand people watched it and then I don't know what happened. Hack a day or someone got hold of it and someone else as well and then suddenly it was like everyone was like together. It was like, oh, check, and then Matrix synth then a bunch of others and then suddenly the next day I woke up and there was a hundred thousand views. I'm like, oh God, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> So well, talking of videos as well, you've started doing stuff for Debug Live as well. And um, 
Yeah. It's absolutely fantastic. Your budget dance music video. That's on like nearly half a million views now. Probably, yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, that was uh, me telling the story of the Amiga. Um, and I really wanted to put down my experience of a kid of sampling, um, you know, because, I mean, I I'd, I'd had my friend's Amiga and I had my, my PC as well that I would sample from. And it was that thing of the adding the stuff that you didn't have and listening to the radio, like I was explaining earlier, late at night where you would hear stuff and you'd have a cassette always ready and you'd be trying to just get those moments that were a, a rave pad or a bass note or a drum beat or something like that so that you could have that in your repertoire of sounds especially when you didn't have access to, you know, professional libraries and things as a, you know, 12 year old. So I just wanted to put that story down and, and tell it from the perspective of just having a simple sampler. Uh, and that's all you had, you know, and maybe some records that, you know, you'd got from a cheap $1 store or some old tapes and yeah. And that B side thing of finding, you know, on the flip side of a, a, a 12 inch uh, or a seven inch that you had an instrumental one that had all of these elements you could, you know, take out, so, yeah, I just wanted to tell that story and, um, yeah, and I, I did spend a bit of time collecting, like making sure I had like a proper of the generation amp and set up and turntable and everything had to be legit for that video. So I went to a lot of effort to try to make it as much of that story as humanly possible, um, you know, of the day. And, yeah, people really responded to it and I think they sort of went, well, no, this is how you did, how you could make music if you just had an Amiga, you know, as a kid. And you've also done, like, commercial music releases. A is for Amiga was one of your releases. Could yeah, you tell us more about those? Commercial music release. I'd just say that that was just fun. Um, like, yeah, well, A for Amiga was just me noodling around with my childhood samples, and I guess a lot of those early, there was um, some sample tracker samples um, right at the start of uh, of the Amiga's days. It kind of became uh, the standards for sounds, and even as a, a kid, uh, you know, with, without access to much uh, software, like I could still get hold of a bunch of those samples. So I just wanted to make something using a lot of those older samples. And uh, there's a couple of tracks on it that do use like my modern samples as well, like uh, from my DX7 and things like I sampled in. But it was very much that 1980s vibe. And I recorded it all out to two-inch tape. So this like really analog giant old format from the you know end of the 70s and we mixed it all without a computer so we mixed the whole thing just from tape uh just using our ears um yeah and it was kind of like that process of of mixing something but you know in a high quality studio i could have only dreamt of using as a kid but using the amiga again and yeah and it was just fun synth sort of tracks yeah and then i guess one of the a record company or what was, was a net label wanted to put it out and so yeah they put that out and yeah, and so it, it became on Spotify and things like that. I've got like heaps more tunes. It's just, I don't know, it was just a lot of effort to get it sounding perfect. <laughs> so I'm just like, <laughs> I prefer it to be a bit more hack and then live at shows. But now I'm obviously with what's going on, I'm considering, well, maybe I need to sort of release some stuff. So, well, what do you kind of have planned next? Have you been making any new tunes or, or are you oh, going to be doing any live stream performances or anything? I've done a bunch of live stream stuff and things. I'm kind of over it at the moment. Um, I think I'm just going to take a break for a few months um, and then come. I've got to, unfortunately, just due to the whole COVID thing, I've got to uh, kind of get kicked out of my studio. So I've got to rebuild a new studio. It's going to take a couple of months, a few months. So um, maybe at the end of that, once everything like I'm joining up forces with a dude who's really cool. Um, in fact, he wants to put A from Amiga out on vinyl. He was like pushing for that phase. He's like, oh, you know, I'll find it, blah, blah. So I'm moving in with really good people uh, who already have a computer retro museum. So it's like, it's a good move, I think. But just reinventing your life takes a little bit of time sometimes. So uh, in, in between that time, I don't think I've got too much planned. I do have a DOS game um, that I'm working on with a bunch of guys. Um uh called dust fury and that's a whole load of ad lib stuff um so uh, the, the sound blaster 16 uh we've got these like um they're kind of like um you know um sort of like techno ad lib techno sound blaster techno super minimal like um it's got all this like yeah this sort of like opening title track so that's that old fm that ad lib sound so i'm working on the soundtrack for that at the moment which is pretty cool that sounded lovely to be fair oh yeah so that's that's kind of like where I, I'm, I'm we're sort of walking towards that but that's kind of tricky because it's um 
it's a Pentium era stuff, like Pentium 100, 150 era, or like or Pentium 100 to 200 era game, uh, all based around voxel graphics. If you remember the old voxel style games, I don't know if you ever played uh, Terminal Velocity or any of those games. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, fantastic. so it's that same style of like, it's like a hard-coded 3D engine. So we're not using engines or anything. We're doing it all with Assembler and C++. So it's like, yeah, it's pretty hectic. And then the music's all ad-lib and trying to get the replayers working and stuff not glitching. But we've got a PC and a Mac build of it that'll run natively and emulate everything as well. So it's kind of it's kind of a modern old-school crossover. You can either play it on a Pentium 100 or play it on your new computer. So I guess that's a really nice hardcore project to be sort of working on to distract myself from you know <laughs> the world at the moment well where can our listeners get hold of your stuff as well and uh, just find out more information on you uh well you see that's weird because i often just do live stuff but look i've got uh i guess on this is soundcloud that's really old because it ran out of room about six years ago and i haven't been bothered to put anything else back up um, there's a torrent of my USB stick because uh, I usually put all my stuff on a USB stick and just sell it at shows. Um, and there is a torrent somewhere out there of that. I don't know where it is, but if you just like search for Citrix, I think somebody dumped it somewhere. Um, cause it's all creative commons. You can do what you want with it. Um, if you just scour the sort of scene.org for Citrix mod files and MP3 files, there's stuff out there. There is the A4 Amiga release, but honestly, I've, yeah, I've been pretty slack in releasing stuff. There was a bunch of great live streams and I was hoping to just be able to playlist all the live streams i've done in the last few months and um they've all just disappeared they've all been taken down or like twitch i didn't realize it timed out so i built this cool list of like hey everyone here's seven hours worth of sets to listen to and they've all gone so i'm like oh. <laughs> awesome thanks so much for talking to us Cedric. so really enjoyed this one no worries good to uh, chat to you as well yeah.